The U.S. refugee resettlement system is a vast network of private, public organizations working together across the globe. The Office of Refugee Resettlement, also known as the ORR, is the federal agency responsible to serve resettled refugees within the United States. The ORR partners with nonprofits in cities across America to deliver services to resettled refugees. In the early 1980s, the ORR started shifting its approach and strategy of integration to a more short-term focused approach. Many things happened, many programs changed, but the most profound change that was set in motion in the 1980s was the reduction of the period of financial assistance. At its peak, resettled refugees would get assistance for up to 36 months. Today, the average is three to six months. The average assistance has gone from three years to one quarter of one year. The focus and funding formulas have also evolved. A lot of the programmatic funding today for the resettlement program is based on the number of individuals in a family, which doesn't take into account special situations. So it is very realistic to see a single mother with three young kids getting the same amount of assistance as a mother and father with two teenagers. The focus, the entire focus of the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program operated by the ORR is rapid employment. There is an emphasis on get them to work right away. And the claim is that when these individuals arrive, they've been through a lot. The idea is when they get to work, it will build up their self-esteem, their self-worth, and it will assist with the integration process. This sounds wonderful on paper, but it's come with many costs and many challenges. The first cost of a rapid employment program that encourages immediate employment is there is no opportunity and no incentive to further one's education. So, a soon-to-be-released report by the Kinder Institute at Rice University, which was actually authored by Jan Digelov and uh, Yehuda Sharem, documents this issue, not only in testimony and data. Resettled refugees have very low rates of furthering their education because of this focus on employment. There's no funding for this, there are no resources. The goal is get a job right away, forget investing in your future. The second challenge of the program is poor English acquisition rates. The ORR does provide funding to resettlement agencies across the country to provide ESL programs. But these programs are usually low quality, volunteer led, and poorly attended. Many men and women that arrive here through the resettlement program never complete or attend such a program because of the focus on employment. And language acquisition also takes a back seat in addition to furthering one's education. And the third unintended consequence or challenge of this program is the concentration of power in a few large employers. And let me explain. In a large city like Houston, resettlement agencies work with a few large employers, such as factories, because they're the ones capable of employing on such a mass level. Almost 80 to 90 percent of all the employment is among these few companies. And like I said, they're mostly factories. Now, when you think about it, it makes sense. The factory needs cheap, unskilled labor to employ on a mass level. Resettlement agencies have, have cheap, unskilled labor that they need to employ on a mass level. It works out wonderfully, right, in theory. But it's a revolving door. And the power is with the employer. 
Resettlement agencies have to report back employment rates, and the funding depends on those. So the employers happily send resettled refugees to the factories so they can check the box, I got them a job. And the, and the factory gets employees, it's wonderful. But many a times these factories are long distances away from where the refugees live themselves. They're low wages, harsh working conditions, and they don't last very long. So it's like a revolving door. The employer knows that when, the next, when a refugee employed here leaves tomorrow, there's another one waiting to come back. So they have no incentive to increase their wages because they know there's a whole supply waiting for them. And resettlement agencies don't want to disturb the status quo, not because they're, they're bad in any sense, because their funding is tied to these, uh, to these issues. The bottom line is that the, this focus on short-term quick employment is actually undermining the long-term indicators of success, such as language acquisition and education. Now, I was doing some research through the ORR and other public reports, and I found some staggering statistics. The report said that 70, 80, sometimes even 90% of resettled refugees were being classified as self-sufficient in the first six months. As a service provider on the ground, I wasn't buying it. I, something's not right. When I looked into it, the soon-to-be-released report of the, uh, from the Kinder Institute also touches upon this, and it explains it with a great example. A family of five that is earning $1,200 a month, which is not enough to cover their bills. They are receiving public assistance, they have transportation challenges, they have language challenges. On paper, they are classified as self-sufficient. Why? Because self-sufficiency, according to the ORR, means you have a job. It could be a seasonal job, it could be a minimum wage job that doesn't pay your bills. Success is defined that we got you a job, we can check the box. Why am I telling you this? Why am I bringing out the dirty laundry of the refugee resettlement system? It is because I believe in it. I've been involved in this work for over a decade. And I wholeheartedly feel beyond the financial benefits, it's a moral and societal responsibility. But if we, the people, the advocates of this program, will be blind to the major flaws of this program, those who oppose it will use it against us. The system hasn't changed much in, in 60 years. But there are a lot of well-documented programs at work that were actually tried out but lost funding. A great example was in 2005, the ORR, and this is a, in a public document, funded a program called the Employment Subsidy Program. The federal government paid private businesses for nine months to fully employ someone with skill. These are categorized as hard to employ people, people with skills, they may not necessarily have the language, but the government paid these private businesses to hire these individuals with the condition that they provide employment continuity or help them find another job if this doesn't work out. Over 900 individuals that were categorized as difficult to employ, skilled, were employed in the program. It had one of the best outcomes for any employment program and one of the lowest costs of any employment program, but it lost funding. What next? We cannot depend on the government. We know how governments operate. Any change that would happen today would not trickle down for years. Even though I believe that citizens like you and me can reach out to resettlement agencies and, and provide help and invest in organizations that are providing long-term support, that is not the solution. I believe the solution is in front of us in the form of private employers with goodwill. And the best example is the founder of Chobani, the yogurt company founded by a Turkish refugee. Mr. Hamdi founded, uh, a, he started a yogurt company in New York, 
and he, he had a factory, and after he, his company was growing, he reached out to the resettlement agencies and said, I want to hire some, some individuals. But they were having a difficult time, so he went and said, what's the problem? And they said, they don't have many, they don't have the language skills, they don't have transportation. He's like, no problem. He provided them transportation. At his company, he set up training for these individuals. So they came, they got trained, and they became part of the workforce. And his, in his own words, he says, these are the most loyal employees that I have. And today, 30% of his workforce is made up of resettled refugees who, who initially arrived as refugees. And the model was so successful that he transplanted this across the country. A small town in Idaho uh, hosts the largest yogurt company in the uh, yogurt factory in the world, actually built by Chobani. It employs thousands of people. They use the same model here. They work with the resettled refugees. They invested in their training. They invested in transportation. They invested in these people to bring them up. And you can imagine Idaho, a very conservative town, initially wasn't you know, pleased with this. But when it saw the impact that this company was making $2 billion annually in, in the local economy, even the mayor comes and speaks in support of Chobani now. And, and Mr. Hamdi says that I didn't do this to uh, financially benefit my company. I didn't do this to get fame. I did this because it's the right thing to do. And today, employers have the same opportunity. We have an opportunity to invest and train a workforce that will stay loyal. Invest in our local economies. Invest in our companies while doing the right thing. I believe that the solution for a sustainable employment for resettled refugees in these companies lies with businessmen who have a heart. Thank you.